Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are, and welcome to the Association of College and University Housing Officer International Session for the Day of Racial Justice. Today, I am excited to have this conversation with all of you, but especially because um, joining me on this panel is um, Von Stangy, who serves as the president of AKUI. He is the Assistant Vice President for Student Life, Senior Director for University Housing and Dining at the University of Iowa. Lisa Freeman is an Executive Board Member. She is our Inclusion and Equ Equity Director, and she is the Director of Residence Life at American University. Luis Iona is Executive Board Member, and he is the one who is leading our very successful and first ever Leadership Academy, and he is a, the co-chair of the AQI Anti-Racism Task Force. He is the Associate Dean of the College of Residential Life and Wellness at Vassar College. And last but not least, and just down the road from the AQI home office is our good friend, Steve Herndon. Steve has graciously accepted our offer to serve as the other co-chair of the Anti-Racism Task Force Steve is the Assistant Vice President for Student Development and Executive Director of Housing and Resident Life at the University of Dayton. So I welcome all of you from wherever you are hearing this broadcast around the world. Um, this broadcast is being closed ca captioned um, and it will be available for you to view on demand at, um, within the next 24 hours. So we have about 30 minutes, so let's get started. And, you know, we want this to be a bit of a discussion. Um, if you'd like to ask questions, please use the Q&A or the chat. Um, so let's just start. Um, uh, for all of you, um, uh, in what ways in your daily work do you see minority professionals being kept from fully engaged and advancing in the campus housing profession? And what do you think we can do about it? Steve, I'll start with you. Wow. Um, well, I think some of it, uh, some of what I have experienced and seen from others is um, opportunities for promotion um, and advancement. Um, at, at times I have been witness to or have um, uh, colleagues who are uh, incredibly gifted and talented, but not necessarily, that's not necessarily materializing in their advancement as it is for others. Um, I've had experiences myself where I have been um, often judged or evaluated based on my last mistake, whereas I have a much stronger um, history of success, yet that doesn't necessarily buy me a lot of um, mm. mercy or benefit of the doubt in the, mo in the moment. Um, whether it's also sitting in meetings and being talked over or I'm there solely as the, the quote unquote representative to make sure that it, from a composition um, standpoint that the group is diverse, but the ways in which we engage, I'm still on the margins. Um, I've had that experience, I've heard that experience, I've seen that experience from other professionals. So those are some of the examples that I've observed and experienced myself. I don't wanna to go too, too long because I, I know that we have other colleagues on the call, mm -hmm. I mean, on the webinar. Thank you. Would anyone else like to, 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 to join in on Steve's um, response? Yeah, I, I can certainly. And I start by saying that all these comments represent me and may not <laughs> represent my institution or a cool OI, but um, I think that uh, we do a lot of work um, utilizing our person of color staff for support of our underrepresented students. Mm -hmm. So they do some things that perhaps aren't always in their job description. And that's really an important role. But while they're taking on the support roles, we may not provide them the opportunity to be strategic and take on other leadership positions in housing and residence life. And because they're passionate about working uh, with our underrepresented students and they get good experience in that area, they become stronger candidates for those DEI positions in the university, perhaps more so than the housing positions. But we, I also know that we have persons of color who are passionate about housing and residence life as well. And we need to provide them some opportunities that give them the skill set in order to move up in our organization, um, as well as the experiences that may allow them to move into other areas of student affairs as well. 
Thanks, Vaughn. Um, another question that we have is, in what ways can campus housing professionals leverage their unique positions to create strong and sustainable support mechanisms for black, marginalized, and underrepresented professional students and, and the community? You know, I'll, I'll take that. I think it's important for us to understand the power that comes in our roles um, and to help prioritize this work um, in our day-to-day -day operations and do so in a way that's not reactive, but one that helps, sets us up to be more proactive. You know, I'm a firm believer that you put your money where your mouth is, you put your time uh, where your mouth is as well. And I think that we as professionals on our campuses have to understand the role that we play, particularly if we are serving in senior housing officer roles and making time and place. Um, but we also have to put the, the, the money and the, the financing toward helping professionals to, to grow and to advance in this work, um, but also to create opportunities um, for our professionals of color to, to thrive and to, to step into um, unique opportunities. Um, the task force is a prime example of what Akua is doing, creating opportunities for professionals. Um, and I think we have to make time and place and do so in a way where it's embedded into our strategic planning. It's mm -hmm. embedded into our kind of blueprint for planning for the year and not done in a way that's a reaction to an event that's happened. And then we have to scramble to try to do something to solidify our position and our stance on our campuses. Mm -hmm. One of, the, one of the things that I was, uh, was thinking about it, both with the first question and this, the second question is, um, you know, I think a lot of this starts um, with leadership and institutions kind of owning um, and identifying uh, organizational institutional deficiencies, right? That it isn't something wrong with folks <laughs> and not advancing, but something wrong with the profession or the organization or the institution that um, is providing barriers. And that particular um, space that um, housing professionals occupy, right, as generalists, as student affairs generalists, is really important, right, to be able to engage um, in, in very frank conversations about how we center marginalized um, identity mm -hmm. in our work in ways that inform student affairs work much more broadly. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm excited about the potential for what that shift can look like. I remember, you know, not too long ago, and it's a dear colleague, and I and I and I care for them greatly. Um, said something at at a conference about incoming professionals and their particular desire to be advocates in the space, in addition to their role as housing professionals, and essentially did not want them to do so, understanding that they had a job to do. And I think we have to kind of engage in the conversation about what it means for folks not to be able to come into our offices, into our spaces and, 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 uh, and discouraging them to be whole, right? In the things that they are passionate mm -hmm. about. And so, you know, there is a fine line and we have to sort through how exactly to engage that, particularly with young professionals, but I don't think telling them not to <laughs> is the answer, right? Um, we wanna encourage uh, the conversations and develop the mechanism by which we can address the things because what they're doing in their advocacy is um, addressing and pinpointing those institutional deficiencies that exist and that we've been reluctant in some ways to to change right as quickly as folks would want us to but i think we're at a particular place where the urgency is is, is felt right now um, mm -hmm. and that we can listen differently uh, to that advocacy and and i would just add that it, I believe it's, it takes a lot for someone to share their story, to share their experience, believe them. I think we're so quick to correct, we're so quick to um, uh, correct their story or to fix in the moment where people, where individuals just might want an opportunity to share their story, believe them, ask them. It doesn't mean that we can't ask questions, but the questions we ask determine, are they gonna see, still see me as a resource or have I lost this opportunity? Because what has turned into an opportunity for me to learn about someone's experience has now turned it into an interrogation of their story, of their truth. So the questions we ask are very important. In the moment that will determine 
how helpful we are in the moment or whether we've lost an opportunity to be a resource or to a, connect, a connection for someone who might need our assistance or support. So Steve, um, I'll put you on the spot here. Okay. <laughs> um, for those who, um, you know, have a commitment to allyship and those advancing professionals, um, can you just give us a couple of, of maybe ideas on things to be mindful of, things to be aware of, so that we are open, that we are engaging with with um, our, our students and, and that they can tell their story and they can tell it in the way that they want to. So it, it, I'm sorry, just for clarity, examples of what that experience would look like as they yeah, share their yeah. story. I think some of the questions that I've asked, and, and, and I've been guilty of this as well, and I've also had the experience of sharing my story and leaving, leaving that, that interaction thinking, okay, I don't feel like I was believed. I don't feel like I was heard. In fact, I feel further marginalized. So I've asked questions. Um, rather than trying to fix or quote unquote fix the situation, but rather ask the questions, what does support look like for you at this moment? Mm -hmm. And how can I be helpful to you in, um, in, 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 in getting the support that you need here in the moment? Um, how, what do you need for me in terms of advocacy? And so people have the opportunity to share their story. And my question is to get a better understanding of their story so that as I advocate on their behalf and provide support in the moment, I'm doing it based on in their truth and not what I have manufactured based upon um, what I believe to be the understanding in the moment. So I think, and I've learned over time through experience and having the experience um, done to me that it's really important in that moment. What does support look like? What, and how can I assist you at this moment to, to, to get the support that you need? Because what I'm looking at is this is the beginning of what I hope to be a continued relationship. And my role in that moment is to establish the connection so that that individual, whether it's a staff member, a student, whomever it is, sees me as a potential resource and as a potential advocate for them. Thank you. Uh, we have a question. Uh, that, that's from the audience and it is, um, how does one advocate without becoming the black sheep or being seen as the person bringing up issues and wanting to quiet the staff? You know, that, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. I, I think it, it really depends on your institution. It depends on the culture. It depends on the relationships. It depends on how things have been prioritized. You know, when I first started, I, I was very new in my profession. You know, I, I didn't mind calling attention to things and asking the tough questions mm -hmm. so much. So I, I think I inadvertently, indirectly, unintentionally called out my director on something uh, about him not using his voice and his, his privilege. And it was in that moment that I realized that, you know, the relationships that I had established really made allowed me to be able to we have those honest conversations that Stephen was talking about. And so I think it's understanding the culture and the climate of your institution. Um, and it's also trying to figure out who your allies are. Sometimes mm -hmm. you got to figure out who might be able to represent the conversation. Um, if you're always the person, and I'm not suggesting that you be silenced, strategize who might be the best person to bring up the issues. Um, understand the different sphere of influences that you or your colleagues might have in bringing some of those conversations up. Um, but it is important to establish the relationships. Uh, I've been very fortunate to be at institutions where relationships really allow for those tough conversations to be had, those difficult topics to be raised. Um, but you've got to know your audience and you also have to invest in the relationships with people to move the needle into what will hopefully be to be able to make an impact. Thank you. Um, you know, taking sort of a, a, a right turn here, Vaughn, you have been on the AKUI board now for six years, maybe seven years. And as you think about your tenure on the board and the journey that the association has taken, um, you know, first as Knowledge Enhancement Director and now as President, can you share some of your thoughts on where the field has done really well regarding anti-racism and where we need to be more expansive in our thinking and our action. And I know that that last part of the question, we can go on forever, 
but mm -hmm. you've had a very unique perch um, to look at the, the, the field across the globe. Mm -hmm. and that's, a, that's an excellent question. I think historically we've done a reasonably good job to at the annual conference to provide programs and opportunities for underrepresented professionals, but maybe not so much in the area of anti-racism, but in the areas of, of um, advocacy and, and um, diversity and equity and inclusion. I don't think what we've done as well until recently is opportunities throughout the year. I mean, I know that we've had, we have networks and things like that, and, and they've been excellent to be able to, uh, to move things forward. I, but I think we focus most of our efforts on diversity, equity, and inclusion, but not so much in the way of anti-racism. Um, now, um, perhaps a cool eye like, it, like society in general has seen what's happening around the world and individually um, we're, we're dismayed and we're aghast, um, but historically the story has gone away and we continue to, and then we move on to something else. Not anymore. Um, now we've, I mean, we have, the world has dived headlong into anti-racism and we need to continue to put time and resources toward that. And we've done that with the, with the anti-racism uh, task force. Um, that is just one initiative that we're going to be looking at uh, over the course of time. Our executive board has become so much more diverse than when I first got on the board. Um, and I think with um, the diversity that comes on the board uh, comes expansive thinking. And I think that that is going to, going to be our hallmark moving forward, that this is a great time for us to be able to, to move forward and, and create change within the associations and the member institutions. And I'd invite anybody else to jump in and, and to add on to that if they'd like. Well, I might ask Lewis to just share a little bit about the Leadership Academy. Um, this was started uh, well over a year ago, about a year and a half ago now, and the first cohort is moving through. And Lewis, um, can you just share some of the, the learnings that we're getting from this group of just terrific 12, folks who I know are going to be all of our bosses someday. Um, yeah, it's an a absolute honor um, to be the inaugural director of this, with this group and to, to have built a community. Um, I think one of the things to know, like with, with the way that the group started, um, it would have been in Toronto, um, was that, you know, we quickly identified that, you know, the Leadership Academy kind of as a, an outcome or as a, a product of it that the, the, the most important thing was community for us. And so how do we build relationships, sustainable relationships beyond even the Academy itself that uh, where, where folks can be, um, as Steve had mentioned early, earlier, right, where folks can speak their truth, where they can be heard. Um, we started out actually with the question that we recently used for the, the, the anti-racist task force by, by talking about our grandmothers, you know, to tell us something about grandmothers. So this is how we opened up the space. Um, when we, we meet monthly, in addition to meeting um, in smaller groups monthly as well, and those smaller group meetings start out by just allowing individuals from their own perspectives, again, these are all professionals of color, um, for two minutes, they get to talk about how they are doing, how they are feeling uninterrupted without questions, just a space to be heard. Um, and for me, I think that's related to the question that was asked about the black sheep, right? It's, it's a space where you, could, where you could come in and you could talk about those experiences that you're having where you're feeling um, a bit on the outs, um, the person that's always bringing up those, those questions and have a group of folks that either you're texting with or that you know that you're going to be meeting with and reflect on the experiences that we're having and to strategize in the way that Lisa um, had mentioned earlier, to strategize ways uh, to, to, to move forward. Sometimes it's really ba basic and practical things that we're working on, programmatic, and other times they're very much related to our identities and those identities are always very much centered um, um, in that space. And it's been an absolute, absolute like privilege the group is at a point now that we've got an, an additional year where they want to work on the legacy. What is it that we do for this next cohort? What is it that we do for the profession to move it forward? But yes, as Mary mentioned, this is a, a group of mid-level professionals who will no doubt be, be running um, departments and institutions you know, soon. Um, 
I'm trying to think if there was if there was anything else with the with the academy. Well, I, uh, you know, one small um, but I think really important impact that they had is they came to me almost immediately. I think we might have still been in Toronto and said, Mary, we looked at the Parthenons and they are the pillars in the field, but I don't see anybody like me. Yep. And they made the commitment to be the champion and to sponsor Dr. Jennifer Wilder. And, you know, they were so proud of, um, of, of not only being able to do that, but to recognize that a cool eye does have a pathway um, to take these types of ideas and to turn them into action. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, on behalf of the executive board, I, I throw out to all of our members. Um, that is, if you see an initiative or a way that we should be, or things that we should be doing differently, um, this is a very open group. We know that we're not where we need to be. And, you know, be it through something as small as the Leadership Academy or the Anti-Racism Task Force, um, you know, we don't have all the answers. Um, and we hope that our members will be engaging with us on a regular basis as we roll out either straw polls or have conversations with some of the members on the task force or the subgroups, et cetera. Which leads me to, to um, uh, one of our last questions. And um, what do we need to do to push the race, push the, um, uh, the needle towards greater racial justice? You know, Akuai, I think we, you know, we have about 18,000 people who are in our, uh, in our database, that's a lot of people, that's a lot of brain power. Um, people sit in, in a position of power. So what are your thoughts? And, and I'll open that up to everyone. Who wants to jump in? Did, did, I, again, I, I do think, um, I know that this is like some really basic, basic things. I think it starts with folks, particularly those in leadership position, um, to acknowledge um, that we we are inherently deficient in some way around in this work and in this particular endeavor. That you know we're not just predominantly white institutions; we're historically white institutions. Many of us are. We are white-serving institutions. I know it's not language that we use, but when you think about the majority of our students, there's ways in which um, there is a, uh, a, a reckoning that needs to occur and an understanding of how we have evolved over time and how this particular moment is asking us to reconsider um, our framing, right? Um, and and um, the way that we engage. And so it's really basic, but it's a, there's, a, there's a, 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 a wonderful conversation so that the person that feels like a black sheep, the question isn't for you to feel that way, it's for, for folks who are in leadership to figure out like, why is this coming up in this way? And why is this the only person mentioning these things? What's, what is deficient about the way that we're operating that doesn't allow for our norms to include this voice more regularly? I, I would say for me, I think one of the, my takeaways from us in the, in, from the, the pandemic is that we often have made our infrastructures so rigid that they can't be reconceptualized, that we can't create um, new structures. And what COVID has forced us all to do out of necessity is to create new. And so it's really helped us, I think, it's helped me to see ways in which um, our infrastructure is too, is too rigid, whether it's around organization, whether it's around our approach around education and learning, whether it's around how we, how include, how um, diligent are we in, in including other perspectives um, that aren't currently around the table or aren't are currently a part of the decision making. And so I think we have an opportunity to create new. Um, and I think we can see, see that through some of the circumstances that we've had. And I think in, I hear a lot of folks say, well, I can't wait for us to return to normal. Well, normal for a lot of people wasn't helpful. Mm -hmm. And normal and for a lot of people was being pushed to the margins, being dismissed, but at the same time being exploited because of your talents 
and your gifts, but not that, but that not showing up in a significant way that demonstrates that you are valued and that your perspective and your truth and your story has merit. We have an opportunity as leaders, we have an opportunity as educators to create new now because COVID has forced us to. And the old systems and structures that that's um, of the past are no longer relevant in many ways. And so while it's the uncertainty can bring about some fear, uncertainty can also bring about some opportunity. And I truly believe that we ha as a profession have an opportunity. I don't know if this directly answers the question, but I think that um, for a very long time, we've asked um, black folks and other person of color to do the heavy lifting. And recently we've heard it, and I don't know why it didn't hit me. It hit me like a two by four. It is, we've heard loud and clear recently, this is a white problem and what are you doing to fix it? And I think that's the challenge for those of us who are in the majority to try to figure out how we start doing the lifting as well, because we haven't been doing our part. And I think that if we're all lifted together, as the old adage says, many hands make for light work. And I think we all need to work harder and work together. Certainly, um, uh, those in the majority need to work harder in order to ensure that we're doing our part as well and trying to solve the problems rather than thinking that that it is not our problem. I, I, I will echo what Vaughn just said. I, I literally was going to say that something similar. Uh, it's everyone's got to assume the role. Everybody has to understand that they play a role um, in this and depending on where you sit at the table, however big your table is, uh, make sure that you can be the most efficient at that table using your resources, using your power, using your influence to bring about change. Um, and, you know, I went many, many years ago to a MLK day of service and a speaker said something and it's resonated with me. And he said, when our problems become your problems, then we have community. And what he basically meant by that was this can't be black folks problem. This has to be inherently all of our problems. So we, when we recognize it as being that, then we'll see an increase in our accountability. We'll see our increase in our owning uh, the role that we've played to perpetuate the problem, uh, but we'll also then assume the responsibility in correcting the problem. And so we all have to play an active and continuous role in moving the needle. Um, and the needle, it might be a small bit, but so long as we commit to seeing it moved, then we'll see great progress uh, in time to come. Well, our 30 minutes has flown by. I would like to thank um, our panelists for being here. Before we, we end, I would also like to um, say that language matters and I will do better as I facilitate through our many discussions that I know that we will have um, uh, coming up. Finally, I would love to um, just share with you the members of our task force. Um, so if you would show the slide, um, this is the anti-racism task force. Um, these are the leaders. Uh, they will be reaching out to members. Um, for those of you who, who applied, know that there will be many impact teams that will be coming from this group. They represent universities from across North America, uh, big schools, small schools, and I believe in most regions. So with that, I would like to thank you. I hope you enjoy the rest of the stay. And of course, if you have any questions, you can always email or uh, ping me. So thank you very much. <laughs>